Well, thank you everyone for being here today, and I'd like to thank John for inviting me to participate in this important conference. Sorry. Get her ready. Well, thank you everyone for being here with us today, and thank you, John, very much for inviting me to participate in this important conference. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. Before joining the Federal Reserve last November, it's fair to say that my economics experience was more micro than macro. I come from a long line of community bankers, and I was honored to serve as the state banking commissioner in Kansas. I also happened to be the first Federal Reserve Board Governor to fill the role designated for someone with community banking experience. So coming from a background on communi in community banking, I'm well versed in analyzing how economic and financial conditions affect individuals, businesses, and local communities. As a policymaker, I find it's helpful to have deep experience with how local and regional economies operate because they're important inputs into the macro outlook. For the last five months, I've been analyzing broader macroeconomic developments and thinking about the optimal conduct of monetary policy, which are relatively new responsibilities for me. One of the reasons I wanted to be here today is because I like to seek out and listen deeply to a broad range of perspectives. That's how I approach learning about any complex issue. And that's why I value the opportunity to hear your views today. And I will be especially interested in the views of the speaker I am here to introduce. Professor Jennifer Burns is a historian of the 20th century. She's both an associate professor at Stanford and a research fellow here at Hoover. Her focus is intellectual, political, and cultural history. Jennifer graduated from Harvard, got her PhD at Berkeley, and then returned east to teach at UVA before coming back to California and Stanford. Jennifer aims her research at the points where conservative politics and free market economics meet. In addition to her academic honors, Jennifer has the distinction of having been both on The Daily Show and The Colbert Report. So after completing her biography of Ayn Rand, entitled Goddess of the Market, she then decided to take on the godfather of monetary policy, Milton Friedman. The intellectual biography she's writing on Friedman draws on the rich archives of his collected works that are stored here at the Hoover Institute. Many of you know that Friedman's scholarship covered a broad array of issues, from the all-volunteer army to debating the merits of a negative income tax to replace the social welfare system. And of course, Friedman had strongly held views on the role of the price system and the proper conduct of monetary policy. As Jennifer will explain, Friedman himself was not completely at the forefront of thinking about policy rules, but rather he was influenced by a history of ideas on the subject. The conduct of monetary policy remains a subject of vibrant discussion today. As you know, we at the Federal Reserve are currently undertaking a broad review of the strategy, tools, and communication practices we use to pursue our dual mandate. It's important to take stock of our tools and assess how effective they are at advancing our goals of full employment and price stability. I think it's also important to understand the history and the development of the ideas that brought us to where we are today, which is why the work of historians like Jennifer can be so valuable. Professor Burns, I look forward to hearing what you've learned about Milton Friedman, the ideas that he and others helped to develop, and how those ideas may still inform our thinking today. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor Bowman, for that kind introduction. And thank you to John Taylor and John Cochran for inviting me to be here. It's a real honor to be here. As the governor mentioned, I'm a historian at Stanford, specializing in 20th century intellectual history. My first book was on Ayn Rand. Oh, there we go. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. Goddess of the Market, Ayn Rand and the American Right. 
And this led me to an interest in 20th century ideas and politics with a focus on the conservative movement. And I'm now embarked upon writing an intellectual biography of Milton Friedman. My major archive is over yonder, uh, just by the tower, 200 boxes tracing everything in Friedman's life. This is an absolute treasure trove, I have to say, not just for historians, but for policymakers who may want to know how the sausage got made. Or, for that matter, may want to know what Milton Friedman looked like in his Boy Scout uniform. <laughs> this is a uh, young, young Milty over here. And um, I was asked to come and to speak today about Milton Friedman and the history of policy rules. And you're probably thinking this is an intellectual arc that goes something from uh, Milton Friedman to John Taylor. And in that, you would be right, but since I'm a historian, I want to go longer and I want to go deeper. So in the short time I have here today, I want to give you a longer history of uh, monetary policy rules in the United States. But I also want to do more than that. I want to talk about the way that monetary rules grew out of a larger political economy. And in this, I want to talk about the way in which monetary rules are part of a larger vision of how the economy should work and how they fit together with what uh, one of my protagonists called respecting the, quote, heart of the contract or the free play of prices. So monetary rules grew out of a larger vision of political economy, often associated with the Chicago School, dedicated to preserving the heart of the contract. And they're intended to be both structure and flexibility. They create a sort of form during which the free play of prices evolve. So in their idealized form, monetary rules are not rigid, they're not inflexible, but they do provide a necessary structure in which economic, the free play of economic forces can unfold. So ideally, they're part of a political economy that finds that balance between structure and flow, uh, between uh, freedom and restraint, and between order and chaos. So what is the history of monetary rules, and where do they come from? The answer is not Milton Friedman, but Henry Simons. Simons was the author of the 1936 article Rules versus authorities in monetary policy. Now, in 1936, the Great Depression is in full swing. FDR is looking for a second term. The New Deal has transitioned from the so called First New Deal, focused on meeting the needs of the economic emergency, to the Second New Deal, looking more broadly at social reform. And Milton Friedman is a callow youth four years into his PhD, and working at his first job, the National Resources Board, which was part of the Labor Department in Washington, DC. And here's he and Rose participating in that immemorial tradition of getting photographed in front of the cherry trees in spring. Um, if it were in color, you would see that more clearly. So who the heck is Henry Simons? He's an untenured professor at the University of Chicago He's the author of a positive program for laissez-faire, published in 1934. He's someone Friedman deeply admired, even idolized. He later called Simons, quote, a shaper of my ideas. A positive program for laissez-faire was particularly important. It came out in 1934, right when Friedman was beginning, or was, uh, about midway through, his doctoral studies at Chicago. And it was taken as a foundational text by he and his closest friends. The mood in Chicago at the time largely leaned left. The Communist Party was popular and widely known. And this book flared into the lives of Friedman and his friends as an invaluable statement of the liberal limited government perspective. They took it absolutely as a totem. And Simons, unlike many others at the time, was unafraid to call himself an unreconstructed liberal, or even a libertarian, a word just beginning to circulate at the time. Now, not only was this book articulating a uh, unique viewpoint in a way that Friedman and his friends found persuasive, but the author himself was charismatic and available. 
Although he was a faculty member, he held none of the bias against socializing with graduate students, one might expect. And he could often be found with Friedman and his friends at Hanley's Tavern in Chicago until the wee hours of the night, arguing politics and economics. Now, I could not find a picture of Hanley's Tavern, so you'll have to make do with the Social Sciences Building at University of Chicago. I'm sure unfamiliar to many people in the room, but a place where uh, Friedman and his friends spent a lot of time. So, okay, what did Simons have to say about monetary rules? Well, first of all, he set them within the context of the Great Depression, which he understood as a monetary phenomenon. As he wrote, oh, I went too fast. As he wrote in a positive program for laissez faire, quote, the Depression is essentially a problem, number one, of relative inflexibility in those prices which largely determine costs, and two, of contraction in the volume and velocity of effective money. Secondly, he argued that monetary reform must come before any other reform. It was foundational. So in this book, he, dis he described a dizzying array of reform. But he noted, quote, the following measures contemplate an economy in which the rules as to the game as to money are definite, intelligible, and inflexible. So they're set within the context of the Great Depression. They're foundational. And third, they're an alternative to administrative discretion. And this is particularly important in the context of the New Deal. So one thing that was surprising in my research when I began is I figured that at Chicago, as the Great Depression unfolded, all these laissez-faire types would say, yeah, whatever, it's just a correction, it'll work itself out. Definitely not. There was strong support for government intervention in the crisis. But that did not mean that as the New Deal unfolded, it went in a direction that all of the faculty there found agreeable. <clears throat> so Simons, for instance, was very excised by the National Recovery Administration, an effort to regulate wages and prices. And so he saw rules as really being unlike things like the NRA, intended to preserve what he called, quote, the heart of the contract, relative prices. So talking about any policy should be defined to avoid the necessity of regulating the heart of the contract. Rules emerged, therefore, as a way for the federal government to avoid damaging the price system while carrying out necessary social functions. And this is really critical. Despite the title of the book, Simons insisted on a positive role for government. That positive program is just as important as the laissez-faire part of the title. It was critical for the government to establish conditions for competition and then to let the competition unfold. Yet it was also important, he thought, for the government to address questions of distribution or questions of the ultimate outcome of the competition. And so you also see in Simons a strong theme of equality, interest in equality running through his policy proposals. So as he put it, quote, a substantial measure of inequality may be unavoidable or essential for motivation, but it should be recognized as evil and tolerated only so far as the dictates of expediency are clear. Now, Simons then went on in 1936 to publish the article I mentioned at the outset, focusing more specifically on monetary rules. And at this point, let me offer two disclaimers. So first, historians of the room may accuse me of skipping over Irving Fisher or Lloyd Mintz, and to this I plead guilty. My goal today was not an exhaustive genealogy, but an illuminating one. So there are some other folks in here. Secondly, Simon's money proposals are inextricably woven into his advocacy of what he called 100% money. Now, buffs will know that 100% money is a proposal to abolish fractional reserve banking. 
And it came astonishingly close to being taken up in the 1933 Banking Act. This was another surprise in my research. Simons literally had a route into the debates in the Treasury Department and the Congress and was sending memo after memo after memo calling for 100% money. And it was considered, just as all the other banking reforms in 1933 were considered, it was on the table. It didn't come to pass, but it turns out to be a policy that Friedman retained some fondness for, even until the late 1960s. He's constantly coming across these footnotes where he sings the praises of 100% money. So that, that imprint of Simon's uh, truly did go deep. Now, I've, I've mentioned 100% money, but for most of this time when I talk about Simon's ideas and his focus on rules, I'm sort of hiving off a lot of that 100% money because it, it, you know, we have moved past that in many ways. And I want to focus more on his legacy of rules. So turning to the 1936 article. Simons here articulated the fundamental justification of rules, which for him was predictability. As he put it, quote, an enterprise system cannot function effectively in the face of extreme uncertainty as to the action of monetary authorities, or for that matter, as to monetary legislation. We must avoid a situation where every business venture becomes largely a speculation on the future of monetary policy. A second sub-theme sub was that rules must be believable and they must inspire confidence. As he put it, a regime of rules, quote, must be good enough so that hereafter we may hold to it unrationally, on faith as a religion, if you please. It almost didn't matter to Simons what type of rule you used. And in this article, much of what he proposed was speculative, and almost all of these proposals are very specific to the Great Depression. The article does end up laying out two rules that are somewhat familiar. One possibility was a price index rule based on an unspecified basket of commodities. The other was a quantity of money rule. Whichever, Simons concluded, the rule, quote, should be designed to permit the fullest and most stable employment and secondarily to minimize inequities as between debtors and creditors. Ultimately, though, it didn't almost matter what rule you used as long as you had something. He concluded, once, quote, generally accepted as the basis of anticipations, any one of many different rules or sets of rules would probably serve about as well as another. Now, today, Simons is largely forgotten. And that's in large part because his career was cut short. In 1946, just as Friedman was returning to Chicago, a move that would make him and Simons colleagues, Simons committed suicide. This was an event that was deeply shocking for Friedman and his tight-knit uh, group of friends, including uh, Rose uh, Director, who is now his wife, Rose Director Friedman, and her brother Aaron Director. And for many years, they continued to bring uh, Simon's ideas to life, to advance them forward, to argue, to write about them. But eventually, there was a shift, and they went in different directions than, Friedman, uh, than uh, Simon's had been at his death. In 1982, Friedman had cause to reread Positive Program for Laissez Faire, and he recounted that he was, quote, astounded at what I read. To think that I thought at the time it was strongly pro free market in its orientation. Now, this was because, in addition to these ideas I've mentioned, Simons called for the nationalization of railroads and utilities. He also called for much higher taxation to ensure that goal of equality. So Simon seems to us a puzzling mixture. He called himself a libertarian. At the same time, he called for higher taxation. Um, he proposed uh, 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 intervention, even nationalization, of key industries. But in truth, this combination of calls for vigorous state action with calls to respect the price system, what Simons called the heart of the contract, is not that uncommon considered broadly in American history. In fact, Simons, this sort of architecture and structure of his thought recalls a much earlier figure, Henry George. This is a bit of a hypersensitive. Um, OK, Henry George. 
Henry George, the towering intellectual figure of the 19th century, the age of the robber baron, the age of the trust, the age of the conglomerate, the age of the Henry George cigar box. And it was also the age of the Georgist club. There were clubs dedicated to Henry George's ideas. There were political campaigns. There were social movements, all revolving around the proposals he put forward in his uh, famous book, Progress and Poverty. And George was known as an advocate of the single tax. What is the single tax? It's essentially nationalizing land, which he thought could not be reasonably held as any one person's property. So you might think then he was some sort of homegrown socialist. But George's point was this, tax land and do nothing else. Then let markets unfold, let the little guy compete fairly, let the chips fall where they may, but have the state intervene in the one area that he saw as collective. So I think that Simons takes this basic architecture combining rigorous state action with laissez-faire and then updates it for an industrial age. And he also adds in the focus on monetary policy. Now, why money? That's like a whole nother talk and has to do with the tradition of monetary economics and analysis at Chicago that Simons was also part of. Simons is actually just the best known and most prolific of these thinkers working the vein of monetary economics. And his 1936 article set out that early case for monetary rules for, as he put it, quote, highly definite and stable rules of the game, especially as to money. Now, what are the linkages beyond the interpersonal between Henry Simons and Milton Friedman? Well, we could ask George Stigler. As he put it, quote, the one specific idea that carries over to the present day in Friedman's writings is Simon's demand for a fixed rule for the conduct of monetary policy. And Friedman, in 1967, had ch a chance to reflect on Simon's legacy at some length in a lecture at Chicago named for Henry Simon, subsequently printed as an article in the Journal of Law and Economics. And here, too, Friedman talked about rules. As he put it, quote, the passage of time has only strengthened my belief in the lesson he taught me, that rules are greatly to be preferred to authorities. So in the long run, rules are what Friedman takes. In the short run, he takes a whole lot more. There are clear echoes of Simon's in what I would call Friedman's post-World War II debut. And I'm speaking here of a 1948 article published in the American Economic uh, Review entitled, A Monetary and Fiscal Framework for Economic Stability. Now, this is not the complete or definitive Friedman. And one thing I stress in my book is that it's important to know that Friedman is really responsive to his context. So looking at Friedman's um, pronouncements and discussions during the Great Depression or during World War II um, is not a good guide to the sort of mature, forward-looking Friedman. So a better guide to what Friedman truly thinks is to find him looking towards the architecture of the post-war world and kind of thinking long-term normal time. So the first time we really see him doing this is this 1948 article. And the article begins with the following propositions. Number one, government must provide a monetary framework for a competitive order, since the competitive order cannot provide one for itself. And number two, this monetary framework should operate under the, quote, rule of law, rather than the discretionary authority of administrators. So, this is the first iteration of Friedman's famous monetary rule. And it's like Simon's article, it's pretty low on details, but it still sounds like Friedman, right? It actually sounds even more like Simon's. At this point, Friedman is still openly supporting 100% money, stating, quote, the private creation of money can perhaps best be eliminated by adopting the 100% reserve proposal, thereby separating the depository from the lending function of the banking system. He goes on to say, if 100% money were not passed, however, one could still approximate an automatic stabilizer by using a rule. Quote, the monetary 
authorities would have to adopt the rule that the quantity of money should be increased only when the government has a deficit, and then by the amount of the deficit. And then it should be decreased only when the government has a surplus, and then by the amount of the surplus. Now, in this article, Friedman's overall goal is to create a neutral framework within which economic cycles unfold. His overriding interest is not necessarily to blunt cycles, but to not make them worse. Let me see if I have a quote on this. But he's still sounding a Simons-esque note of equality, which is distinctive. He goes on to discuss, while a truly free market would yield far less inequality than currently exists, I should hope that the community would desire to reduce inequality even further. Moreover, measures to supplement the market would be need to be taken in the interim. So again, you see in this article, him bringing to the fore ideas which are very reminiscent of Simon's, both in their very specific formulation and in the larger set of justifications in which they're sent, or the larger social goals in which he thinks they will eventuate. So a lot happens between this moment and a program for monetary stability, the 1960 book where he really sets out uh, his advocacy for a targeted growth rate in the money supply, and the basic policy that he'll advocate for the rest of his career, adjusting the target percentage from between 3 to 5 percent to 1 to 3 percent. One of the things that came in the interval is 12, 12 years of research with his collaborator, Anna Jacobson-Schwartz. Most of it focused on what was happening when Simons wrote those first articles, what was actually empirically happening in the economy. And this research is what led Friedman to reevaluate Simons in some ways. As he concluded in 1967, having reread Simons on the wake of, of having completed this research with Schwartz, he concluded, quote, the monetary theory impressed me as sophisticated and correct the proposals for reform as largely irrelevant and wrong. On the specific policy question, Friedman advocated a quantity rule over a price level rule, reversing the suggestion by Simons. More significantly, he found monetary policy more powerful than Simons had ever anticipated. As he wrote critically, Simons, quote, implicitly regarded the Great Depression as occurring despite, not because, of government monetary policy. So Simons lacked one of the major justifications that Friedman would use for his rule, the uh, incompetence or inability of the Federal Reserve to, to be qualified to do its job no matter how qualified the members of the board were. And so I think here we might be seeing the hidden influence of his other Chicago colleague, F.A. Hayek, who really emphasized the infinite complexity of human societies and human systems and the inability of any individual to really comprehend or understand them. So, okay. Got to skip forward quite a bit till we get to the modern era. There are decades more of economic history, including punishing inflation until we get to the Taylor era. Today, we still have monetary rules. You've probably been debating them all morning. Indeed, this Simon's distinction between rules and discretions has become cliche or just some basic concept that everyone knows. And this larger legacy of Simon's has largely dropped out. Not just 100% money, but his vision of the state and his concern for inequality. So what if we tried to bring that larger political economy back in? What if we thought about those basic principles, absent the depression context, perhaps attentive to the other challenges of our time? What would that look like today? I'm the historian, you're the policymakers, love to know what you come up with. But I could add a few suggestions or speculations. We've seen that monetary rules and the school of monetarism itself grows out of a larger historical and political framework. Over the course of the 20th century, Friedman and his compatriots made a convincing argument, not just for the rule, but against regulation. Now, Chicago is sometimes given too much credit for this. What really mattered was that these ideas traveled and were found, 
widely plausible outside of Chicago. There was a lot of low-hanging fruit. So one of my favorite stories uh, about this moment and this movement comes from airline deregulation in the 1970s. And um, economist Alfred Kahn, a self-described liberal Democrat, assumed the chairmanship of the Federal Aviation Board and found himself confronted with a heated dispute about the size of a sandwich that an airline might be legally permitted to serve. And Kahn said to himself, is this what my mother raised me to do? <laughs> and he concluded, no, and he became a champion of deregulation. And the point is that, that he was doing this as a Carter appointee from a very different perspective. So many of the ideas articulated by Friedman and his colleagues were so compelling that they became dominant. They didn't require an ideological commitment to understand or embrace them. <coughs> But there is danger in intellectual dominance, just as there's danger in great power. It makes it harder to see what's left out. Monetary rules connect to a larger political economy that's not just about freedom, and it's not just about markets. The rules are intended to underwrite prosperity and stability. And they're part of a larger proposition on how to balance the excesses of capitalism, to connect 20th century thought to American traditions of anti-monopoly. They're related to an earlier effort to wrestle with chronic instability that characterized an earlier era of American capitalism. So rules are perhaps the last vestige and most durable inheritance of this moment. As such, they connect to a larger set of questions about the perennial trade-off between growth and stability, equity and achievement, liberty and power. That larger context need not be lost forever. It can remind us, as we contemplate the dilemmas of today, that rules are worth thinking with. I appreciate your attention. I'd be happy to take a few questions in the little time we have remaining. Thank you. Michael. Oh, no. <laughs> Friedman student, monetary economist. That was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. And I was there. I was at that speech when you gave it. Oh, wow. Speech. OK, great. Um, so I guess I wanted to <clears throat> make a point that about some of the others in the room. And George Tavlis is here, and he's writing a book about I, that. I know. I'm but, afraid um, of him next. You've got to trace this back to the tr tradition in classical monetary thought going all the way back to the you know the beginning of the of the 19th of the 18th century the 19th century and the debates about rules versus discretion that came out in the currency banking school and the bullion so in a sense Friedman not only did he was he a student of of Simons and Mintz and 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 Viner okay but he knew the history and so he related it to the earlier debates that occurred in England about should the monetary authorities, you know, follow authorities, as in the discretion of individuals, or should they follow a rule? And of course, the rule they were thinking about back then was the gold standard or Palmer's rule. So in a sense, it, it goes back and back and back. Maybe it goes back beyond that. So I just wanted you to. Yeah, thank, thank you for that contribution. And to that point, I would say, would remind you that Anna Schwartz's first work was basically a voluminous history of the Bank of England. So she brought a lot of that historical knowledge and context to Friedman when they came together to collaborate. I see in the, a question in the middle of the room. I think they'd like a mic. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sebastian Edwards. Uh, that was uh, fascinating. Uh, I'm really happy that you brought the 1948 paper, which I think is where everything starts. And the point I want to make is that the supporters of MMT, mm -hmm. Modern Monetary Theory, are arguing that Friedman would be in agreement with them. And it's related to the passage that you read, where he says the Fed should only print money when the government runs a deficit. And uh, now we're seeing, and, and, and all of a sudden, and very unexpectedly, at least to me, MMT has become uh, sort of a, a, a snowball that grows and grows every day. And it's the, 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 the debate is going to be extremely interesting as increasingly they're going to say, hey, if Friedman was around, he would agree with us because of 1948. So mm. it's very important to read what he's writing very carefully. Because as you say, he was, that model assumes a Henry Simons banking system, 
with a 100% reserves requirement, which it's not exactly what the MMT people are saying. So I think that uh, your work, and, and, and going back to that, is going to be very, very important in what we're going to be listening to in the next uh, few years. Yeah, thank you for the comment. It, it is really remarkable how these things are coming up again. The, the part that I quoted about the government printing and not printing, that was actually a footnote. Um, and I was like, mm, should I put this in? It's a footnote, but it, it, was a, it seemed he was articulating, um, and it also does connect to 100% money. So I was sort of artificially taking 100% money out, but a lot of things change when you do that. And 48 also is the folks who are more in the um, details of his monetary evolution. No, that's, that's not fully formed. I mean, that's pre-monetary history. So it's, it's his thinking, I guess, as an intellectual historian. I'm always interested in the really deep architecture and structures of thought, in which I do think Simon's remains important. But on the details and how that actually plays out, he has quite a bit of distance to travel. So thank you for that comment. Yeah. They, they are very um, keen to have you use the mic, if you wouldn't mind a moment. There it is. It's coming up right behind you. Yeah, hi. Uh, Jim Dorn with the Cato Institute. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, did you come across any work by Clark Warburton in your research? Because uh, Friedman was uh, uh, influenced by Warburton's uh, quantitative work, and Warburton had a K percent rule, but it was a little bit more sophisticated than that. And uh, I, I, I'd like to see if you, know, you looked at that literature at all. Also, in my own research, I've come across early American writers, for example, Eric Bowman, who was a uh, uh, MD, and uh, he wrote back about 1819 or so, uh, early 19th century. Uh, he was a pioneer in, uh, in uh, early American uh, monetarist, actually. Uh, and he's got some very interesting stuff. It's hard to get find his work, but uh, Johns Hopkins has a nice early American uh, uh, library with respect to currency reforms and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, the question about Warburton, I um, would encourage you to speak to your table mate, George Tavlis, because I know he's just written a paper kind of excavating the Wharton, Warburton and um, Friedman correspondence. And I think there is good evidence. I mean, you have letters where Friedman's like, gee, you seem to really have a point, you know? So I think he comes in, I think, in the early stages of writing a monetary history, um, and I think they're quite in correspondence. So um, I would say there's a good deal of literature out and coming out on that very topic. So yeah, that'll, that will be part of my story at a, at a certain point, yes. I see someone in the, in the middle of the center. Hi, uh, Chris Crow. Um, I found the, um, the whole talk fascinating, but the, the bit you. that was perhaps most surprising to me was this um, element on inequality, because mm -hmm. certainly when you, when you think of the Chicago School and, and Friedman and the kind of policies that, um, that you know, that tradition is associated with, that, that there's not, you, don't, you don't think of a concern of inequality as, as being there, and you know, where, where those sort of policies have been implemented, there seems to have been a correlation with inequality going up, not down. So how, how is it, you know, wh wh why do you think that concern of inequality has sort of fallen by the wayside in that tradition? Yeah, I mean, that's really one of the, the big questions of the project. When does that happen? How does it really happen? Um, I mean, you see it quite early, very dominant, and then eventually it just becomes a, a more and more minor note. I, I'm not 100% sure. I think in some ways Friedman um, you know, makes choices, and he says towards the end of his life there's a really astonishing um, moment when he's in his free-to-choose television show. He's being really interrogated by one of the guests, and you know, his, his main argument would be, well, freedom minimizes inequality. You know, and he really, th this is very important to him. And then, then eventually this person gets him to say, well, what if free freedom doesn't minimize inequality? And he says, well, well freedom is my god. Um, and so he sort of makes that choice. Freedom is my god. I think when I look at the big picture of the discussion and the dialogue, it seems like earlier this was a concept that was debated and, and um, important to, to many people across all um, spots on the ideological spectrum and over the course of the 20th century there's maybe a narrowing where to talk and to be concerned about inequality sort of puts you in a left liberal more radical camp and then you see conservative and center-right folks just dropping that language altogether. 
um, which I think is a diminishment of the discussion overall. So I think looking at Simons and, and Friedman can, can help us see that that was once a robust part of the conversation. I have a feeling that you all have fascinating technical papers to start arguing over. So um, thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it.